Hey, good morning. This is Jamie with Stillmeyer Games. Today is what Wednesday, March 9th, and I am happy to be here as I usually am to answer your non spoiler questions to share Stillmeyer Games news and discuss a variety of random topics like what games I'm playing right now, what type of chocolate I'm eating right now, fun stuff like that. Um, yeah, so let's just jump around. What am I playing right now? Uh, recent plays, I learned Meadow and So Clover, where I was taught Meadow by our uh, retailer relationship manager, Susanna. She was kind enough to bring that to game night last week, and I learned Meadow, really cool game. I also learned, uh, so or played, keep saying learned, I played So Clover, which was kind of a follow-up to Just One, and I really enjoyed that as well. On my online game night last week, I played Seven Wonders and Conspiracy. I taught Conspiracy. That's one that I actually did teach, taught Conspiracy. And then I hosted a magic draft for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty this past weekend and had a lot of fun with that. Let me know if you played any of those games, if you enjoy them or what you've played over the last few days. Hey, Tony, Tim, George, Dominic, thanks for joining me this morning. Happy to see you here today. Um, let me see what else is going on today. Oh, I wanted to say happy birthday to our web designer and web, de web developer, Dave Hoover. Dave uh, has been wonderful to work with over the last few years, probably five or six years at this point, maybe even more. And uh, he is the one that has really helped us revamp our website, revamp our web store, and have now four separate web stores, one for the U.S. and worldwide, Canada, Australia, and the U.K. and Europe, and, and the EU. Um, Dave has just been wonderful. So, Dave, happy birthday to you. In case you watch these, I really, really appreciate you. Carlos here has a question. He says he played Dune Imperium, one of my favorite games. He said he played Dune Imperium for the first time. I really enjoy it, but it was odd to me that the game has an end game, has end game objective cards in it, but they don't have their own deck. They are part of the intrigue cards. That's right. So there are these random cards that you can draw that you can use at different times, depending on the card. And one type of the card, there are just a few of them, are end game bonus cards. He says, so you need to draw intrigue cards without knowing if you're going to get one or not. And since the base game only has three among a lot more non-objective cards, there's very little chance that you'll get one. Um, and I think the reason for this, Carlos, is to add a little bit of mystery to the end of the game. You might be racing to the end of the game, but you still have to consider the possibility that an opponent has one of those cards. So there's, uh, I mean, they're intrigue, they're intrigue cards. They're meant to be a little surprise, a little bit um, offbeat to keep you on your toes. Um, Carlos goes on to say, Storm games usually have objective cards, but they are always dealt at the start of the game to every player and usually have to choose among two or acquire new ones during play. When do you think is better to have objective cards so scarce and hard to obtain instead of making them part of your initial setup? Uh, I mean, I think Dune Imperium is a bit of a unique case because those intrigue cards are designed specifically to keep your opponents on their toes, to keep them guessing and keep you guessing about which intrigue cards they have. I guess the core layer in one of our games might be the combat cards or the magic spell cards in, uh, in Scythe and, and My Little Scythe. Um, that's maybe the main thing. I don't have, well, actually, there, I think there are a few visitor cards in Viticulture that deal with the end of the game, but they're usually not end game points. They are, uh, because you don't play visitor cards at the end of the game, you play them during the game. Rather, they're uh, instant bonus, and then you have to have meta condition to keep that, to keep a bonus, or you lose some victory points at the end of the game. But we probably could have some visitor cards to give you end game victory points, but they would be common knowledge. I, I just, I, I don't think it works often. I, I agree, uh, Carlos, that I, I think it's uh, fairly unique for Dune Imperium. Um, the one other thing I'd add to that is that Dune Imperium already has a couple decks of cards. And I think for any game, if you're asking players to shuffle, say, three decks of cards at the beginning of the game, that's fine. But once you get up to four, five, six, seven, eight tons of decks of cards, that can be a bit diff more difficult to manage. We're even pushing that aside because we have encounter cards, we have objective cards, we have combat cards. I think I'm forgetting one other type of card. We have a lot of card decks of cards. So the more you can consolidate those decks, I think the easier it becomes for players to, to set up the game and clean up the game. Just a few thoughts there. Yeah. Melissa said that her friend got Furnace and she quite liked that. Um, I've only played Furnace once, but I really did enjoy my play of it. Uh, it reminded me a lot of a game that I really love which is uh, Fantastic Factories. Looking at my shelf over here. Dominic says, what did I think of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, the new magic set? He said he had a lot of fun with the pre-release. I love drafting magic, really any set of magic. 
And this set was no different. I, I really, really love this set, especially because of the theme. I love the original Kamigawa, which was set kind of in an old fantasy world. And then they used that same world, but jumped to the future, kind of the cyberpunk future in that same world. And that to me was really, really cool. I love seeing how worlds change over significant amounts of time. It's one of the things I love about Brandon Sanderson, who congratulations for having the number one Kickstarter campaign of all time now, Sanderson does. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the theme and the mechanisms in it I thought really cool too. I like the sagas that turn into, into creatures. I like the constructs. Um, there's other things too that I'm forgetting right now. But yeah, the vehicles, the mech vehicles, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I really liked it. Gary says that his copy of Libertalia arrived today. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Shipping is underway for champion copies and uh, our fulfillment centers are saying that they should be able to ship out all champion copies by the end of this week. So the pre-order was last Wednesday. Pre-order is technically still happening. It'll still happen. Uh, we'll continue to, to sell copies of Libertalia into the future. Um, and so if you didn't get Libertalia and you're hearing great things about it, you're welcome to still get it from our web store. There will also be a retail release date on April 29th. Um, but yeah, if you're getting your copy, I hope you, uh, hope you're, I hope you're enjoying it. And a quick reminder, I guess, now that I'm, I'm talking about it, if you do have any questions about specific cards, um, or specific loot tiles in, uh, Libertalia and you post them as you should kind of on board game geek publicly or on the Libertalia Facebook group, which is very helpful. So other people can learn from your question, please include the text of the card that you're talking about. Um, because oftentimes we might be not at our, especially if we are the ones, we at Summer Games are the ones that answer it. We may not be at our computer, so we may not have the, the cards or the digital cards at our fingertips. But if you include the text for the card in your question, we can answer right away, no matter where we are, if we're on our phone. So that's super helpful if, if you do that. Tim says, I was thinking about the plastic goals you were talking about. Plastic goals. Plastic goals. You were talking about do you think there's a chance of a problem with wood eggs not matching plastic eggs in an expansion when is plastic still okay plastic goals you might i'm guessing you mean plastic eggs tim i'm trying to think of what you're talking about there plastic goals um if you're talking about plastic eggs uh it, it is true that we are working to convert some of our plastic components into wooden components in future versions and um we have found that Wood, wood does look a little bit better than plastic, but oftentimes it looks better than plastic. Um, and so I think there are a few rare instances where, where plastic might work better or look better. There are definitely some instances like miniatures where there isn't a, an alternative unless they're going metal, but that's definitely not good for the environment either. So, um, but I, I, yeah, I, I, I guess the, the matching thing, if as long as we can get the same size and color, I think that's the crucially important part if we're changing a component from plastic to, to wood. Um, I think at the top level, you asked, when is plastic still okay? At the top level, disposable plastic. That's our top, uh, highest priority. That's the thing that we're trying to get rid of first, like shrink wrap and... Um, uh, yeah, really shrink wrap. And, and we also changed our plastic bags. We've changed all of our plastic bags to biodegradable plastic bags. So that even though it is plastic, it won't be around for a hundred years. It'll just be around for three to five years. Um, so that, that's the, the, the highest level, the highest priority. And then below that are other plastic components, which are still very important because plastic is made from, um, non-renewable resources. Tim says he enjoyed Libertalia and the new realm for Rolling Realms over the weekend. Uh, that's the Libertalia inspired realm for Rolling Realms. And by the way, before I read the rest of Tim's question uh, or comment, I am playing Rolling Realms today, probably around one o'clock. I, I don't have an exact time, one o'clock central time. But if you want to join me in the Rolling Realms Facebook group for a live play round today of Rolling Realms, uh, feel free to do so. The realms I'll be playing with are Libertalia, Wingspan and Euphoria. So the new Libertalia Realm, Wingspan, and Euphoria. If you don't have that new promo realm yet, yet you can use another realm and play along live with me. Uh, Tim's comment continues. He says, I found that when playing with Terra Mystica Rolling Realms and Libertalia Realms, one can't quite max out in stars in Libertalia. It, all, it requires four coins and the other realms only offer two. Yeah, there are weird combinations of realms like that, but you're all on the same page with other players because when you're playing Rolling Realms, all players have the exact same three realms. Chris says, how has the rollout of Libertalia gone? Is there a good response? So far, it seems so good. Um, we really did try to eliminate any ambiguity in the cards in Libertalia, but as always, there are questions about the cards. But I can tell you that we tried really hard to do that, and we haven't gotten a deluge of questions yet, which is good. Um, just a few questions here and there. 
But uh, yeah, I think it's uh, that's the thing that I look for. I think when people are receiving the game, are they happy with what they're what they've received? Is it clear? Are they happy with the components? Are they is is it bringing joy to their table? And so far, that does seem to be the case. But most copies have not arrived yet. Um, most copies are still most champion copies even are in the process of being shipped. And next week, our fulfillment centers will move on to the non-champion copies. Chad says, "Oh, trap cards and tapestry. Yeah, the cards and tapestry. We're talking about intrigue cards in um, in Dune Imperium." And the trap cards in Tapestry are an example of why the Tapestry cards are private information in Tapestry, because there are some cards that you can play when it's not your turn to surprise your opponent. Yeah. And I think that would be weird if they were in their own separate deck of cards. I think it's good that they're combined for that element of surprise. Uh, Tony says that he played Obsession last night. I did ask earlier of what games people have been playing. Donna said that she played Western Legends and can't play, wait to play it again. Aisha said that her copy of Libertalia Rolling Realms and the Libertalia Promo Pack arrived today. Uh, already arrived today. That's awesome. And she is so excited to try all of them. That's Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing your excitement for that. I'm so, I, I love this part of the process when people are receiving a new game that we just announced and made. Uh, yeah, so thanks for sharing that. Leaf said that he's in meetings all day and can't watch live, but he is excited for his copy of all three Rolling Realms promos to arrive with Libertalia, and he hopes that it might be on his doorstep today when he gets home. Tim says, have I seen the new Tidal Blades, Raw, and Sleeping Gods? I have seen them all. Those campaigns aren't live yet. Are they, Tim? Or if they are, let me know, because um, I'm very excited to get a couple of those games, maybe even all of them, um, but I haven't seen them go live yet. Let me know if I missed that. I think I've signed up for, for live notifications for all three, um, but if I missed one, in particular, well, yeah, all, all three of those games are going to be pretty pretty tempting to get, yeah. Uh, let's see. George has, has a weird shipping thing happening here. He says, uh, first time when a similar game package comes with DHL and also first time when I had to complete like six forms for customs. That's a lot. Like for packages coming normally from the U.S. or Australia. Um, even though this package is being shipped from the U.K. It wasn't a problem. That is odd, George. Six forms is a lot of forms to fill out. Um, I don't know why Spiral Galaxy chose DHL. Maybe they found they've had better success shipping with them to Romania. I, I, I don't know, but that's good feedback. Let me know if that becomes an ongoing annoyance for you. Nancy Jane says that a lot of folks at her local game store are excited to receive the uh, retail version. Or no, there is only one version of Libertalia. The, the Libertalia on the retail release date. That's great. Yeah, we're we're. It's a. I think it's a fairly um, retail friendly game. Like we we tried to even though we deluxified a lot of the components in the game compared to the original version, we tried to keep the price at a reasonable level so that it could be appealing for retailers and their customers. And it's very easy to demo at retail stores. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about the, the retail potential for the game. And I also appreciate all of you who, the early adopters who, who pre-ordered it directly from us. It's nice to have both. Uh, Jerry says he found a copy of Grim Forest, a game from the company that makes uh, Tidal Blades, uh, on my recommendation on games to try if I enjoy Libertalia. Yeah, I, I, that, definitely. He says, it's beautiful and wonderful. Thanks. We'll be playing it to tide me over until Libertalia arrives in a few game, a few days. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Liber Grim Forest is a great game. I, I named that as one of my favorite Take That games because it's like a friendly Take That game. Even if you uh, take your opponent's or, or remove your opponent's friend, I think they're called friend cards, they still get a friend in return. So you're giving them a friend and uh, getting rid of their friend. I don't think you actually get to take it. It's been a while since I played it. You get to take it or do they get have to discard it? Um, but it, yeah, it's kind of a, a, you're taking that, but you're also giving something to, something to them in return. Jeff says, how much air and production color problems would you accept versus remake a run of a particular component? Like as, so there's a red coming in a near violet, for instance. Uh, it depends on the component a little bit. Like if it really, uh, so, so I guess we're talking about uh, printed components versus non-printed. I think the most common uh, printing error, or not error, but printing thing that happens is where the card backs aren't exactly the same as the previous card backs. On a previous printing or expansion versus core game, that is very common. And it's just difficult to do. I think it's difficult for any printer to exactly color match card backs. Uh, even the Magic the Gathering has, has. I think if you want to play in a tur Magic tournament, you are required to sleeve your cards with a solid back sleeve because as good as Wizard of the Coast is at making cards that are consistent in shape and size and card frame and all that stuff, they still have card backs that are different colors from different print runs. So, um, But the thing is, 
nice, I think, for, for different card backs for most games, not super competitive games like Magic, but most games, if you're only looking at the top card of the deck and you're not like closely comparing it to another card, you don't know which printing or which expansion, which core game it came from. And uh, even if you do know that, if you're really able to tell that, does it really impact your decision to draw that card or not? I think it's very rare that it actually does. Um, I think it is a little different if there, if you have like, I don't know, uh, cube, red cubes in the core game, and then you release extra red cubes that are necessary when you release an expansion for the game, and those red cubes are no longer red, and you really can't tell if they match the red or maybe if they match some other color in the game. I think that's when, uh, that's when it becomes a bit of a problem. Molly says she's also excited to get her three new Rolling Realms packs with her copy of Libertalia. Hopefully that's coming very soon, Molly. And Freddie's just popping in to say hi. Oh, Molly says her order hasn't shipped yet, but it should very soon, Molly. Our, our film centers are working very, very quickly, I think, through the, the champion copies at least. And then they'll take a little bit of a breather and then get to the non-champion copies next week. Uh, Sayway says, we got our copy of Libertalia and we love the game. Also glad to see the reduction of single-use plastic and the addition of biodegradable plastic bags. We're working on it. Yeah, we're getting closer. There's still the shrink wrap on the outside of the game that we're working on. Not quite there yet, but but we'll, we'll get there. But I appreciate you noticing that, that, uh, you know, it's, it's one step at a time and, and we're taking those steps. Let me jump over to my topics real quick, then I'll come back to the questions. I love the questions today. Thank you for joining me for this, for this chat. Um, things that I've been working on recently, did a play test last week and a play test yesterday. And I actually have a play test that's just off camera over here that, I, that I'm hoping to do this afternoon. I've been doing a lot of proofreading for product that's in, uh, in progress right now and working on design and development for um, some Rolling Realms promos. So that's some behind the scenes stuff, some vague stuff, but vague behind the scenes stuff that we, we've been working on. Also for the nesting box, man, I've had some interesting discussions about the Wingspan nesting box, which is the organizer box for Wingspan that we're working on. And freight shipping is still making this box um, pretty difficult. We are definitely now going to uh, combine it with the next Wingspan expansion. So you'll be able to buy the expansion by itself, but if you want to buy the, the, uh, the, the nesting box, it will also come with the expansion inside the box because uh, the box by itself is just incredibly expensive to freight ship. Um, normally freight shipping isn't that expensive even for a giant product like that, but right now it is so expensive to freight ship this box that it drives the price up so high that it really only makes sense for us to charge that much for the box if we include the expansion inside the box as well. So you can you have a choice there between the two options, but one thing that I think I'm gonna have to change um, is that originally I said we were gonna offer the Wingspan expansion by itself, the nesting box by itself, and then the next nesting box with the expansion inside. And I think for at least this first print run now, based on the numbers, um, unless freight shipping prices drastically go down, uh, we are not going to offer the nesting box by itself in the first print run. So hopefully that'll change, but that's, we've been doing a lot of calculations recently to figure out how to make that work. Um, and it's tough. I don't, I don't like to, to bundle things like that because it, it, it eliminates people who just want the nesting box. But uh, I, th I think we need to do it in this case. Anyway, we've been running some calculations for that to try to make that work. Some content I've re released recently. I did a video about accessibility, the nine different categories that I think about and that I encourage other designers, creators, and publishers to think about when they think about accessibility. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. That was my Sunday video this past week. Um, I did a, a blog post about Brandon Sanderson's massive Kickstarter project, which since that post last Thursday has grown up to over $26 million, I believe. And I did a blog post on Monday about us reaching our 11,000th champion. So we now have 11,000 Stillmeyer champions, which just is amazing to me. Thank you so much for, if you're a champion, thank you so much for, for championing our content in that way. And I hope you are getting value out of the champion program as well. I have some other quick topics, but let me jump back to the questions real quick. Uh, Nancy Jane says that she played Isle of Cats for the first time. The first time, that's awesome. Love Isle of Cats. We've been playing it with the expansion recently. It was really, really fun with the expansion. Um, Christopher says that he just received Libertalia and the three new promo realm packs. That's awesome, Christopher. Tim says, if I played with a beast in Isle of Cats yet, and we have, yeah, we have played one game with a beast so far. That's one of the new expansions. He says it definitely made things trickier when trying to fill the boat. It does. The beasts do add a little bit of a puzzle to the boat as to where you place, how you place and where you place different pieces. 
Chad says, last night had a eureka moment where I had an idea on how to make a game mechanism work really well on a game I'm designing. Can you remember a time that you had a eureka moment for a Stonemeyer game? Um, what's, what's a recent one? I mean, so the two recent ones that come to mind are Red Rising, when I wasn't, I was really struggling with the design and I realized that the Fantasy Realm format, the rough framework for Fantasy Realms worked really well for Red Rising. And then for Rolling Realms, uh, really honestly, throughout the design of Rolling Realms, I did not realize that it was going to be, in a, that it could be, or that it was going to be an expandable game. I knew that we could add new realms, but I didn't put that in the expandable game category. And so when I realized that after we released the game, after we published it and people started to talk about it that way, I was like, wow, this is really cool. We can do some really, really cool things with this. Um, yeah, so that that isn't a game mechanism specific thing, but it does impact the game. That was those are two that come to mind. I've had some recently as well, but I can't talk about them yet. Nicholas says some honest reviewers have liked Libertalia, and the art is growing on them. Are fans making Winds of Galcrest fan fiction yet? Not that I'm aware of. He says the art seems super geared for it. Bats who can see well enough to be trusted with a gun. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see a little little fanfic for uh, for the for the world of Galcrest. Kevin says Spiral Galaxy, that's our uh, UK European film center, probably uses DHL because it is technically the German post office, which has a large reach in the EU. That makes sense. I didn't know DHL was a German company. Uh, Tim clarified that those games, the new Tidal Blades, the new Sleeping Gods, and the new Ra are coming to Game Found and Kickstarter. I thought so, yeah. Um, I, I was just worried that maybe I had missed their actual um, launch date, but I haven't yet. You can definitely sign up for all of those on Game Found and Kickstarter. Yeah. Some, some cool games coming to this platform soon. Dan says that he played Libertalia at Dice Tower West this past weekend, and it was a big, it was a hit at the con. That's awesome. I'm glad a few copies slipped in there in time for the convention. Did you play anything else, Dan? Anything that's not released yet that you that you really enjoyed that you uh, that you would recommend? Uh, Tony says, are champions who ordered other products with the Liber their Libertalia order seeing later shipping times? Just wondering, as I haven't seen a shipping notification yet. I don't think so, because I've seen a lot of notifications here from people saying that they ordered Libertalia with the promo packs, and they're already getting shipping notifications. Tony, I think the, the shipping order, it varies based on every pre-order, um, but oftentimes it ends up being some combination of, uh, or at least an important part of it is where you're located. Like they might ship all Midwest orders one day and then the next day they'll do west coast or east coast they're and i'm not saying that's the exact order just they pick a, a way to batch the orders in a way that's very efficient so they can get a lot of orders out the door and they start to do the more time intense orders or, or different batch of orders not necessarily even time intense but a new batch of orders later on but it's just like a few days apart so you should get a shipping notification very very soon i appreciate your patience Hilda says, designer here, printing can be such a color in, uh, printing can be such a challenge in color matching. Pantone inks can help with consistency, but they can be expensive as they require additional plates outside of the CMYK plates to be created for printing process. Hilda, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I think this, um, when we talk about card backs, we're often looking at simpler card backs that can be, uh, that are easier to color match. And that comes down to the Pantone matching for it and not having a lot of Pantone colors on the backs of those cards. We've tried this really hard with Between Two Cities in particular, I remember doing it with that, maybe Between Two Castles too, where the backs of the tiles are kind of abstract and simple, just a few colors. And the reason for that is that we are really trying to match those tile backs um, from one print run to the next and including the expansion now. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge, but Pantone colors can help. Zach says, would I make another game in the Libertalia world? Was there ever a thought to set Libertalia in the 1920s size world? Uh, there wasn't that. I mean, that might have been cool. I never, I never even thought of that. I, don't, I, don't, I can't recall the time I was thinking about that. I don't have any plans to explore Galecrest any further, but maybe. You never know. I think it depends maybe at least partially on the success of Libertalia. David says, Arc Nova has multiple maps, uh, player maps. Uh, and recommends allowing new players to use the easier mats to get an advantage in the game. Have you included this type of recommendation in any games, and would you include it in future games? Uh, that's a good question. I love when cooperative games do this in particular. I love when they say, okay, this is the difficult difficulty level for different characters, different bosses, or at least a uh, complexity level. I, I like that a lot. Um, I haven't done it in any of my games yet, because I, I try as hard as possible to make all different asymmetric elements as accessible as possible to all players. Um, 
I know that varies a little bit, and sometimes they're, I, I maybe lean a little bit on fans of the games to come up with those lists because I'm so close to it, it's really hard to do with asymmetric competitive games. Um, but I do really like in Arc Nova that they have the option for all players to play with a simple uh, map or, or player map that is exactly the same, uh, very easy to teach and learn the game that way. And then later on, you can flip those mats over to variable asymmetric sides. I really like that. I don't think it works for everything. Like in sides where you have those dual layer player mats, you can't just flip it over. You need to add a third layer to do it on the back and that can create some, some production issues. Also makes those mats a lot thicker. But with certain mats, I think it's possible possible to do that. I haven't, uh, I don't think I have done it with a game yet, but I, after, given my love for Arc Nova, I think it's something that, that's on my mind and that I'm thinking about a lot more doing, trying that in the future. Um, there's one game in particular right now that I'm working on that, uh, that I would definitely consider it for. Um, yeah, we'll see though. We'll see. Kind of having an A and B side. Kevin says, uh, he played some Concordia and Libertalia, went to Bielcrest, played a solo game of Libertalia, and it was very smooth. I'm glad to hear that, Kevin. I loved Team Altama. I have my monthly meeting with the Altama team tomorrow. Mike says he's been playing a lot of Tapestry since it showed up on Board Game Arena. They run a lot of tournaments, which end up end up to be 1v1 games. The Futurists are basically unbeatable in a 1v1 game. In, three or more, in a three or more player game, it's balanced nicely because they can't hold everyone off every track. But in a two player game match, they essentially get the top two landmarks on every track, which makes them too strong. I've almost 50 games played 1v1 where someone had the Futurist and the Futurist only lost one of those games. That's pretty significant. Is there any way you can look at the data and suggest that in a 1v1 game, Futurists are not allowed to be picked? I'd be hesitant to make that type of move for the Futurists, um, but, uh, but it is possible. I can say that our data analyst, Jeremy, is looking at the data right now from Board Game Arena and is looking at things like that. He's looking for things like that. In general, the types of adjustments that we hope to make, that we that we like to make, or we don't like to make any adjustments, but if we have to make one, we like to make it global. We'd like, we'd like those adjustments to apply to all expansions, the core game, any combination, any player count. But that isn't always possible, as you're pointing out here. Sometimes a civilization really, really varies based on some factor like player count. I think there's one other civilization where we, maybe the Heralds, that, or maybe the Historians, one of the two, where we uh, where the adjustment is player count dependent. And so if that's the case, if we need to make a player count adjustment uh, specific for the two player count for Futurists, we'll do that. We're working on that right now. We do have access to all of that Board Game Arena data. Yeah. Let's see. Justin says, I've noticed over the past few months on Board Game Geek trying to offset hype by giving low ratings before a game is delivered even out to be played. Unfortunately, that's a long running problem with Board Game Geek. Um, yeah. He says, I understand why it's done. I, and this is the explanation that I've heard. I don't think it makes a ton of sense. He says, people can get very excited and rate a game a 10 when they have not even played it. However, this seems like it's a form of gatekeeping. Yeah, I mean, I always err on the side of positivity. So I think the best way to follow a game on Board Game Geek, if you're interested in it and, has, and you haven't played it yet, is to just subscribe to it. But for some people, maybe it's better. It's easier for them to rate the game. I don't know why. I, I don't understand that. I think it's just you click the subscribe button. But... If it is easier for them to to uh, to follow the game by by rating it, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can condone that because I don't think it makes sense to rate a game that you haven't played, honestly. So I would just subscribe to it. I, I and I wouldn't try to balance the ones with tens because then the people who put in the ones uh, justify it by saying other people are putting in tens and they haven't played it either. So I it just it, you know it's a it, I, I don't think that's a good back and forth approach to it. Uh, I haven't even gotten to your question yet, but. Um, but also, I do err on the side of positivity. So I, I could probably find some justification to rate a game higher even though someone hasn't played it just because they want to keep track of it. I can't find that same justification for rating a game a one or a two that I haven't played. Um, that, to me, baffles me. It just seems like uh, internet, negati internet negati negativity. Uh, I don't know what good comes of that, basically. Like, what are you adding? What value are you adding to the world by doing that? Uh, by rating a game really low if you haven't even played it. Anyway, Justin says, uh, I've also noticed some of our games get a lot of low ratings to offset hype as well, which is bewildering to me. Uh, what is, I guess your question is, what is your opinion on this and maybe ways to try and mitigate it? Uh, I think the ways to mitigate, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think there's anything I can say that will stop the type of person who has decided they want to offset other people's excitement for a game by rating a game low or for whatever motivation they have for rating a game low if they haven't played it. If you've played a game and you really don't like it, 
by all means, rate it accurately, rate it, rate, give it a low score, by all means. But it does not make sense to me that you would rate a game that you haven't played. And in particular, it doesn't make sense to me that you would rate a game low that you haven't played. Um, I know, I know that might seem a little hypocritical, but because uh, I, I also don't think you should rate a game high that you haven't played. But uh, it just it do, it doesn't seem like it adds any value or or joy to anyone to to rate a game low that you haven't played. Eh, I don't know. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I even struggle to rate games low that I have played uh, because I know how much time and effort and work goes into games. Even if I strongly dislike a game, if I really don't want to play that game again, I know how much love went into making that game. Not just the designer, but the graphic designer, the artist, all the playtesters, the proofreaders. A lot of people put their time and energy into that game, and I feel bad about it. Um, but I do if I, I try to rate my games accurately or rate games I've played accurately on BoardGameGeek. Anyway, Tim says, uh, on to other topics. Tim says, re the retail release date for Libertalia is April 29th. Maybe I could showcase it on April 30th at your brother's bookstore. Absolutely. Yeah, April 29th is a Friday. We try to pick release dates that don't coincide with Magic the Gathering release dates. Um, and this is a weird instance where Magic, we, we chose this date because Magic had a release date the next week, I think like May 5th or 6th. And then Magic, after we chose our release date and announced it, Magic changed their release date to April 29th. So if you are in a game store, you might see a little bit more publicity for Magic on April 29th. But Libertalia's retail release date is that day as well. Uh, Dick says, do I have any information on localization for the Wingspan Destiny Box now that you can now that you combine it with the next expansion? Um, not yet, no. Uh, that, that's a decision that we'll be talking about with localization partners soon. The, the, the nesting box itself is language independent, um, completely language independent. Uh, it's the, the expansion going inside of it that is not language independent. So that will be a decision that our localization partners will have to make. We have some, we have some costs to share with them about that. It's expensive to make the box, but it's the freight shipping. The freight shipping is more expensive per box than, than the nesting box itself, which is ridiculous. That's crazy. I'm talking about just freight, like freight shipping from the manufacturer to uh, to uh, uh, our fulfillment centers. Yeah. Let me skip back to my topics real quick, and then I'll end up for the last 30 minutes for questions. Chocolate of the day. I bit the inside of my cheek really hard last night, really, really badly. Even as I'm talking, I can feel it um, while I was eating dinner. Uh, just took a too big of a bite of bread. And so there's no chocolate of the day. I can't eat any sweets today because I know they will just aggravate my cheek. So please eat chocolate of the day for me. I want you to choose your favorite treat that I can't eat today and enjoy it for me. Let me know what that's going to be. What is your treat? What is your chocolate of the day? Um... What else is happening? More fun than that. Uh, Survivor. Survivor's coming back tonight. I'm really excited about that. I love the show Survivor. Season 42, I believe. Yeah, season 42. Excited about that. We also just finished watching the Netflix limited series, seven episodes, a show called Midnight Mass, which is a creepy show, but I'm so glad I watched it. I'm not really into like scary movies. Definitely not a, a horror movie person, but uh, Midnight... And, and I, but I wouldn't say this is a scary or horror film or, or series. It's more just creepy. And it asks some really great questions. It's very thought-provoking. Pro pro the cinematography is beautiful. I highly recommend Midnight Mass if you're up for something a little creepy. Maybe very creepy at times. And we're watching Abbott Elementary as our lunchtime show, our funny little lunchtime show, which also has a lot of heart to it already, even just through two episodes. I'm loving the feel of it. It feels like the office in an, el in, in an elementary school. Christopher says, when you're designing cards for a game, how do I get past writer's block? Um... I kind of just keep going, and if, I, if I'm really, really struggling, I put that game aside and work on another game for a while. I usually try to have two games going at a time for that purpose. Kyle says, is there a timeline for the, the announcement on the upcoming Viticulture expansion? I haven't announced an official time, timeline yet because we're kind of waiting on seeing how freight shipping will do for, for the expansion. It, freight shipping is in progress, though. Yeah. Uh, Tim says he's keeping his fingers crossed for a Galecrest campaign like Rise of Fenris. We'll see. That would be cool for, for Libertalia. Adam says that he thinks uh, Wingspan has the best rulebook for explaining how to properly use all the cards. And yeah, I have to give credit to designer Elizabeth Hargrave there. She, just the time and effort she puts into that appendix. And uh, it's, 
it's it's incredible. It's incredible what she does with that. A lot of people are actually involved now whenever we make an expansion for Wingspan to get that appendix right. But Elizabeth does the, by far the bulk of the work. And then we have some proofreaders come in and look at it. At a, a certain point of the process, I'm involved in making sure that the cards match the appendix and, and vice versa. But yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And just full credit to Elizabeth for, for the work she, that she puts into creating that. Another Tim, we have lots of Tims today. Another Tim says, I'm loving Stemeyer's growth towards signing new games from new designers and the bringing back of Libertalia from Paolo Mori, who is a personal favorite of mine. Paolo is amazing. He says, but are any of those four letter code names a new Jamie design? And is new game design still possible while steering this amazing company? I can't answer the first question. It's a bit of a spoiler. I can say that I'm always working on a few games. I love designing games. I'm always working on them. Um, and so it definitely is part of it. It, it, uh, it is sometimes harder to find time to design games uh, based on all the other stuff I'm doing. And a lot of that is still involved in game development. I'm involved in game and uh, expansion development, which is kind of the refining process, not the actual uh, design, the creation process. But uh, you will see games from, from me in the future. You will. It might just, uh, might just take a little bit longer than it used to. Yeah. Adam says, good morning from Singapore. Any more news about the Wingspan Big Box and the next expansions? I, want, I have been talking about the nesting box a little bit today, that, we are, uh, that we've been running some calculations for the nesting box this week and realized that the first print run, um, is, it won't be possible to sell the nesting box by itself because of the freight shipping expense. But we will be selling the nesting box with the next expansion inside of it. So the two will coincide. You'll still be able to buy the expansion by itself, or you can buy it inside the nesting box. Chad says, it sounds like you're in the middle of designing more games now that you have in the past. Is that true? If so, are you, how are you managing to spin, spinning all those plates? Yeah, kind of tying in with the, the other question that you might have missed a few seconds ago. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much always designing two games at a time, jumping back and forth between two games. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that's actually changed uh, it, compared to the past. Mike says he loves, he already got in three games of the Retalia and he's loving it, thoroughly enjoying it. That's great to hear, Mike. I'm glad you got, got your copy so quickly. That's great. Jerry says, I finally got the chance to go through the immersive side art book over the weekend. Have you and Jakob considered expanding the IP into other mediums like a TV show or a movie? I don't own, I only own, or some of our games only owns the tabletop rights to Scythe, but uh, Jakob owns all of the rights. That's why he's made, made a video game with it. And I think he has, he has a film deal, but a deal doesn't always mean that something is in the works or that it's moving forward. So I hope to see uh, some sort of series or film someday in the side world or, or the 1920 plus world. Um, but uh, but I, I, that's, uh, that's for Jakob to figure out. Um, and I'll just be an excited person who watches it when it happens. Quint says, this past weekend I went to the Salt Con. Went to Salt Con at the, the biggest board game convention in Utah. What is, he says, I should come someday. What is your favorite convention to go to and why? My favorite convention is Geekway to the West in St. Louis. And maybe a close second, the Stillmire Games Design Day. It's not really a convention, more like a one-day event. But I really do enjoy that as well. But yeah, Geekway to the West here in St. Louis, where you just come and play games for four days. I love it. And feel free to come. Come this year. Come in May. Get fully vaccinated. Get fully boosted. Be okay with wearing a mask for a few days. It's fine. We did it this fall. It was totally fine. And uh, we had a blast. So, and the uh, by we, I mean, I play games with a lot of random people at Geekway. If you come to Geekway and you have a game that you want to play with me, a published game, I want to play it with you. And I want to learn it from you. I want, I want to have fun with you. I really mean that. I, I like to play games with a wide variety of people at Geekway to the West. Don't be shy. Please come up to me and say, Jamie, I want to play a game with you. That really means the world to me, uh, world to me when, when someone says that. Um, I, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I don't often go up to random people and say play games. So I totally get that if you don't feel comfortable, but I really, really want to do that at Geekway to the West if, you, if you're able to attend. Sean is joining us this morning. Uh, Tim says, have I ever had pink chocolate? I have. I've had a little bit of pink chocolate. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but it's always intriguing to have a little bit when I, when I have it. Do you, do you like it, Tim? Are you, are you having some right now? Uh, just scrolling through for a few questions here. Darren says, I believe there will be a Prince of the City event in your city for Vampire the Masquerade Rivals. Have I played in any tournaments for a game like Magic the Gathering or Rivals? Way back in the day, in my mid-20s, I did play in a few constructed Magic tournaments and maybe even a sealed deck tournament as well. Um, but, uh, but I haven't done that in a long, long time. Yeah, been, been many, many years since I've done that. <laughs> uh, sorry, I read a comment about the, the BGG rating system. Chad says, the whole rating before, before playing thing brings out the worst in humans. Unfortunately, sometimes it does, yeah. The thought that they need to balance the universe is baffling. Yeah, that, that is 
truly bad. Like, like I think the most baffling thing to me about that is, sure, there may be some people who rate a game that they haven't played a nine or a ten for whatever reason. Whatever reason they may have, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think you should rate a game at all if you haven't played it. But whatever reason they had, they might do it. But that someone else sees that and thinks, I need to make this worse. Um, by rating it low, even though they also haven't played it. It's just like, I, I don't understand that mindset. Like what, what, what is, it's like, it, have you ever met someone who, whenever they give a compliment, they also balance it with something negative. Like, I don't think that's necessary. I think it's okay just to say that you like a thing and tell, tell people why you like it. Maybe there's a few reasons that you don't like it too. You don't always have to say them. If it doesn't add value, you don't have to say those things. I'm not, I hope that doesn't come off as, as censorship or, or as uh as uh, uh, I don't know, tone policing or whatever, but um, I think sometimes it's okay to just just to share the thing that you like about something. That's the whole point of my YouTube channel. I, I talk about my favorite mechanisms in games. I, I really try to just focus on the things I like. And in many of those games I talk about, you better believe that there are things that I don't like, but I don't spend time and energy talking about them. I don't think that adds value to people, at least in my format. I'm not a reviewer. I definitely think though reviewers, I think it's great if reviewers offer things that they dislike and that they like. I think it's both great to, to, to share both of those things. I think that's kind of the responsibility of a reviewer. I know I just went off on a rant there, but yeah. David says he, had, he, has his, he had his first play of Rolling Realms this past weekend with five players, and unfortunately the players found it quite complicated. We particularly struggled with the rule around not being able to activate a realm more than once unless you use resources. Just curious the reason behind that particular rule. Everyone had fun, but it ran a lot longer than we expected. Uh, ooh, I don't know. That's such a core rule to the game, David. Um, that's just... I, uh, I, uh, what is the reason for that? It's, it's just... Uh, that's just the rule of the game for Rolling Realms. That, that's... Um, the game kind of forces you to divide your attention and find ways within that puzzle to also try to activate that third realm. Um, I know that isn't a great answer, though. Uh, so I'm trying to remember my original reason for saying that you couldn't just use both dice in one realm on the same turn. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. I did, it just from the beginning, from very early on, that became the rule and it just worked so well. Uh, I really had not heard it being a, a problem for many people to do that. Um, but I am sorry that you all found it found it complicated. I, I know that's rough to have a complicated first play, especially for such a kind of a, a simple game as Rolling Realms. I would recommend this though, David, um, or anyone who struggles with with Rolling Realms, if that is if that's a thing, just play a round of it. Don't play a full game. Just play a single round. And if players are struggling with it that that round, but and yet they want to try again, use the exact same realms and try again. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Literally, I don't think. Uh, I don't think anyone has asked that question in in the two years that that Rolling Realms has been around because it, it from the beginning it just felt so intuitive to only be able to use one die in one realm and one die in another realm um, to the point that like there's there's a way in the game to break that rule. Um, uh, so basically, I think it's a I think it's an important constraint to the game. I think games benefit sometimes from having constraints, and that restraint in Rolling Realms is part of the puzzle of the game. Um, and if you want to break that restraint, you have to get three pumpkins, and then you can break that break that restraint. Yeah. Darren says he has a birthday coming up on April 30th. Happy upcoming birthday, Darren. Paul says, do, do you, did you know that Wingspan was mentioned including a box shot cover on the on mainstream TV in the UK? Yeah, uh, Coronation Street. Yeah, we had, uh, that was pretty crazy that that happened a few weeks ago. Um, I need to share that. I don't know if I have shared that story. Uh, on the blog, but I probably should. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I should have that story. Um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I, I, I am aware that happened. It, 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 the show producer came to us a while back and said, hey, we might have the possibility of putting this the game on our, on our show, just in the conversation, casual conversation on our show. Would you be okay with that? And I said, sure, yeah, of course. Um, I think I may have sent them a game. I can't remember if I sent them a game or not. I'll have to go back and look at those emails. But yeah, they, they came to us. We were like, yeah, of course, that'd be that'd be really neat. And they, the characters have like kind of a whole conversation uh, about Wingspan in this in a in a British soap opera. Pretty crazy. Kevin's excited about Survivor too. Joshua is as well. Near and Tim are saying they love Midnight Mass. Um, George says, I'm curious how much time I must I must keep the metal doubloons in the biodegradable plastic bag before it starts to, de to decompose. If you put your plastic bags, the new biodegradable plastic bags that we have in um, in, in uh, Libertalia, and I should mention that all of the bags in Libertalia are biodegradable. 
Um, even though some look more biodegradable than others, the others are also biodegradable. Uh, if you keep them in the box, they're going to be fine for many, many years. I think the plastic might just get a little bit weaker over time. But if you bury them, and I wouldn't recommend burying the plastic, but if you like th eventually throw them away, they end up in a compost heap somewhere. If they end up in the trash pile, they will, unlike other plastics, decompose uh, fairly quickly then um, instead of taking maybe forever to, to decompose. Tim says he likes the size of the, of the Libertalia rulebook. Yeah, we went with smaller rulebook size for, sizes for Libertalia. I don't know if you can really tell here. Here's Herm of Reference next to my body uh, for the size of the Libertalia rulebooks. Familia says uh, their wife and me are huge fans of Viticulture. We have all expansions and played over 100 games since 2020. So far, we have not found any game that is as good as Viticulture Tuscany. Thank you so much. Uh, they also say that uh, they're looking forward to that new expansion. Thank you. I I love hearing that. I'm glad you two have found a lot of joy on the tabletop playing uh, Viticulture and Tuscany together. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing. And I'm excited to share the new expansion with you very, very soon. Uh, Susanna chimed in. Susanna, our retail relationship manager and friend, says that Geekway to the West is amazing for game playing. She says it was her first convention. I didn't realize that was her first one, Susanna. Um, and she can't wait for it this May. Yeah, I should have known that. Uh, but uh, yeah, Susanna attended Geekway to the West last last May. We actually, we I played games for the first time with Susanna there. That's when I really met Susanna face to face. And now she is working with Stomar Games to improve our, our relationships with retailers. Yeah. Uh, Justin says, I want to reiterate that I don't condone rating games load offset hype. My question made it sound like I do. I don't know. I didn't get that from your question, Justin. Sorry if I sounded that way. I, I was more responding to those who do that, but I, I didn't get the impression that you were doing that. Uh, Navia says he's going to be going to Geekway in St. Louis for the first time this year. Any re recommendations or must-dos? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, a, a lot of different things. Let me find the Google Doc. I have a Google Doc recommending different restaurants, my favorite restaurants in here in St. Louis. Let me pull that up, and I'll post that in the comments below. It's, it's food, geared towards food, but I think traveling, some of the fun things to do when you travel is eat, is eat good food. So I will post that, Navi, in the comments below if you want to check that out. And it would be great to play a game with you at Geekway. I'm glad you're coming. So glad you're coming. David says, just to update, the main confusion was around the bonus type, which has to, uh, the bonus dice in Rolling Realms, which has to be used in the third realm. Maybe we played the rule wrong. We did play one round and then a full game. We did have fun. The bonus dice. So there's no uh, inherent bonus dice, but you can create extra dice. Uh, like if you um, if you use two coins or three coins, you can create a three value die. So I, guess, I think that's what you're uh, saying. It's kind of a virtual die that you're creating, and you it's just a die, and so it follows the same rules as any other dice in the game. You can't use that die in the same realm that you've already used that that turn. Yeah. Um, but but David, importantly, is you can use dice and resources in, in any order so if i roll uh if i roll a three and a one and i create a virtual four and i'm more interested in using that four right away i can use that four in realm a and then i still have realms b and c to use for these dice uh yeah yeah the, those are the rules of the game feel free to, to uh maybe encourage you or, or your group to play against me against the live plays that i do uh on youtube and and in the rolling realms facebook group because I kind of talk about the rules as I play. Maybe I can maybe I can be helpful uh, in that way if you if you play along with me. But whether it's a video I've done in the past or in real time um, on the Rolling Realms Facebook group, as I'll be doing today at uh, hopefully around one o'clock Central Time. Tim says, "Think of it like think of it like between two castles and cities. You need to work on going for all three realms instead of just maxing one out maxing out on one realm and not doing as well in others." He says, "I'm guilty of paying more attention to the tapestry than between two cities and other realms when it when it's out." Yeah, I think everyone has their, their favorite realms to focus on. George says, uh, you might break the game if you, if, you, if you could use the same number multiple times in the same realm. Um, it would probably break the game. As design, yes, it would break the game because it would complete certain realms really, really fast. Uh, I actually think it would lead to a worse experience too because, it, because you would complete certain realms so fast. There would be instances later on where you'd have numbers that you just have nothing to do with. You can't do anything with those numbers because you, you've maxed out a certain realm. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it helps players. It might just be, uh, a little bit of a learning curve. Let me jump over to my, a few remaining topics. What have I missed? Uh, I've been uh, talking about game events, game conventions. One thing that I'm excited to do that I just spent some time arranging this past weekend is that there's a place called the Gamers Ranch here in St. Louis, uh, or not here in St. Louis, here in Missouri. It's about two hours outside of St. Louis. 
and uh, it's it's kind of just a, a big vacation home uh, with a disc golf course and a ton of board games, ton of board games, and also some video games too. And it's just designed for people to come and spend a few days and play games together. And I've never gone, but I'm really excited to go. And I'll be going for the first time this summer. I've been ar arranging a trip with some friends to go to this gamer's ranch. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited about that. I wanted to share my excitement for it. Uh, and also, I guess the last little topic is that I played disc golf over this weekend and had a lot of fun. Got my first zero. So I got, I hit, I played par for the entire course, uh, for the first time ever, which was, felt really good. Felt really good to do that. It was fun to get out there with Megan. Luca, Lucas says, I'm talking from a Polish YouTube channel perspective, and sometimes you have to check and record new board game reviews, and you don't like this game. What's the worst game in your opinion? Um, well, I'm not a reviewer, uh, so I, I, I guess I, I part of my, I, I, could, I, I, don't, I don't rate games that way. I rate games on Board Game Geek. If you really want to know my opinions about games, go to Board Game Geek and look at my ratings. That's the only place where you can really visibly see if I dislike a game or how much I like a game. But, uh, but Lucas, I'm just, I'm not interested in talking about games that are we're talking about how much I dislike certain games. There are games I dislike, but it's just not how I want to spend my social media currency to, to do that. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really appeal to me. And it, it honestly, it doesn't appeal to me when they're, when they're YouTube, I, I like, I like that when, when reviewers share what they both dislike and like about a game, but when reviewers have like top 10 lists about games they hate. That doesn't excite me. Like I, that's 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 an unsubscribe for me when when that happens because I, I I don't know. I it, it I know they get a lot of clicks, but it it uh, doesn't bring joy to me to watch those videos. I I, I want to watch top ten games about uh, the top ten games that they enjoyed over the last month or the last year or their lifetime, not the games that they hate. So yeah, just personal preference there. Christopher says, "Do you think you'll make the Libertarian Money Box?" Available separately. It feels sturdier than the clear plastic trays I have in a couple of similar games. That's a good size. Would love to use it for other game storage. You know, that's the first request for that so far, Christopher. Um, and he's talking about the uh, the plastic tray that we made that's included in the game. I have my metal coins, coins in it, but this is just included in the game. And it is a pretty sturdy box. We had to design it specifically to hold these heavy metal coins without the top just falling off. I agree. It's a, it's a pretty good box um, or tray. Currently, we don't have plans to sell it separately, but uh, if there's enough demand for it, we might consider it at some point. Yeah, it's I, I would say it's it takes a lot of demand now for us to sell something a la carte. Uh, it used to be easier in the past, but because a la carte items don't have SKUs, we have to kind of sort through and find them. We can't ask our fulfillment centers to sort through and find them. We have to sort through and find them and ship them to each fulfillment center. So it isn't the most efficient thing in the world, but uh, but it is something that we can consider if there's enough demand for it. Uh, Tony says, I know you mentioned it was on your list to try, but have I played Star Wars Outer Rim, uh, Outer Rim yet? And no, it's on my list to play at Geekoid of the West. So if there's someone who loves Outer Rim and wants to play it with me, uh, teach and play it with me at uh, Geekoid of the West, uh, I'd, I'd love to play it with you. I will, before Geekway, if, for those of you following along, um, before Geekway, I will post my uh, the list that I really want to, the list of games that I really want to learn and play at Geekoid of the West. So if you happen to love any of those games and want to teach and play them with me, uh, you can check out that list. But I won't post that until uh, probably early May. Ivan says, will there be a Red Rising expansion? We haven't decided that yet. We're kind of waiting for the sixth book to come out, the second trilogy, the end of the second trilogy, um, to decide what we're going to do there. Yeah. George says, have, have you noticed that as we grow older, the time seems to pass faster? How much free time do you have nowadays compared with previous years or Jamie at 25? Time does seem to fly. I think part of that is running the company, too. Um, but yeah, time does, time passes. Yeah, yeah, it, time does seem to pass pretty fast these days. Yeah, I'm just scrolling down here to see if I missed any questions. Chris is joining us. Chris Goodlett, the charity gamer. Kevin says a lot of re reviewers say that X game plays up to four or five players, but they only want to play at three or less because of the time increase. Do you have similar feelings about some games? Yeah, definitely. There are certain games that I like to play at a very specific player count. Um, and I'll talk about one that I love because I like talking about things I love. One is Parks. I think Parks is designed to play up to five players and it does play up to five players. But for some reason, I really, really like Parks at two or three. Um, and I don't like it as much at, at four or five. Two or three, just I, I feel like I have uh, the right amount of agency, um, maybe the right amount of downtime. But yeah, I, I, I like always really highly recommend Parks at two or three. Um, 
this isn't the case for all games. And it's not always because of downtime. Sometimes it's because of ex like uh, how easy it is to access certain actions, things like that. But, uh, but that's the one that comes to mind off the top of my head. But there are definitely other games like that on my shelf that I think of. Like Downforce. I really like to play Downforce with exactly six. I love Downforce at exactly six. It does play at lower player counts, but I think it's best when each player has exactly one car. Chris asks, how are Biddy and Walter? They're doing well today. Walter's had a kind of a wild morning. He's running all around playing with toys. Uh, and Biddy, I don't know where Biddy is. I think he's probably sleeping under the bed right now. Yeah. How are your cats? Or your cat, Chris? Skylar says, not sure if you're looking for topics for your videos. I always am. Uh, how would I consider, would I consider making a, a video of top 10 games with rondelles? Yeah, sure. I would, I would definitely consider that. I'll make a note of that right now. There is a video kind of close to that. 10 rondelle games. And let me know, what, what is your favorite rondelle game while you're, while you're bringing that up? Um, the topic that I did that's a little bit similar to that, I've done a top 10 games with uh, one-way action selection tracks like Tokaido, like Glenn Moore, games like that. Um, I really like that style of game. I, and I think sometimes there's overlap with Rondell's. Tokaido, not, not, so, not, not so much. But uh, Glenn Moore, I think, could be called a Rondell game. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, so check out that video. You'll get some of those games. And I, I'd be happy to consider that in the future. Yeah. Chris has four cats now. I thought it was just one. Four cats. <laughs> he says it got out of control. <laughs> Um, I think that's about it for today. I think I've covered everything I want to talk about. And I, I appreciate all these questions. A lot of fun questions today. A lot of tough questions today. And um, as always, I'm happy to answer them. If I missed anything or if you have a question that occurs to you after watching this, pop over to the YouTube version of this. I'll get notifications about questions there a little bit better than on Facebook. I'll put this video on YouTube now so you can post those questions there. And I hope you have a great Wednesday and a great week. I'll, I will see you next week. All right. Take care. Bye.